Yeah, but why smart people make stupid decisions? Um, as I mentioned this morning, human beings are by nature, we are creatures of habit. And we have to actually work to be mindful. And that really is the source of this idea. So well, how does mindlessness manifest both for us as learning professionals in terms of how we develop, but also in terms of what we develop for our, how do we get our participants to be more mindful? And how can, and as you think about it, how can then this idea of immersive learning be useful both in the development of it, but in its application to actually enable people to be more mindful about what it is that they're doing? Because at the end of the day, we cannot make them, as I mentioned, we can't stop them from making mistakes. But we can actually have them be better at making decisions, incre increase the probability of a better decision as they progress, or that they actually know how to deal with a bad decision when it's, once it's been made. So just really what I just, you know, in terms of what I mentioned this morning, the idea of some of the things that specifically relate to this, the idea that simulations allow us to expand our experience portfolio, to fill it with a wider range of experiences. So sometimes that actually could be the objective, to actually enable people to have additional experiences that may look like, in a, as Will had mentioned, in the variety of contexts. So we can actually give a similar type of experience, but change up the background, change up the, the types of people they're interacting with, change up the various, um, some of the, the environmental issues that are going on, and allow them to have that opportunity for practice, for retrieval, in different uh, contexts, which will then relate to somehow more closely to whatever it is they're going to be facing in real life. The idea of promoting critical thinking and improved decision making, the idea of thinking before acting, the idea of taking understanding consequences so that before I actually take that gut reaction, I've actually considered it uh, at least one more time a little bit more fully. And lastly, to take advantage of storytelling from an engagement perspective. And again, one of the things that relates to the context is the closer we can have capture a story that has some of the contextual components that they experience in real life, the ability to retrieve to be more mindful based on the experiences that they've had is going to be increased. So again, from the article that um, is up on the site, um, just reminding again and um, continue to make connections. And again, the idea of providing opportunities, I'm going to come back to this idea. It's important also to separate the learning opportunities. And when I, this is kind of where I'm going to go at, at this point. When you talk about this idea of space learning, the opportunity to take these smaller, as you mentioned, the, in the ethics group, the you know, company that does four minutes every month. But the idea of taking the, uh, the learning objective that you have and breaking it up into its component parts. I like the, when he talked about, uh, I forget if this was the second session, um, where he talked about a situation in which instead of giving the full situation, you break up, if it's in a sales training type of thing, where you're breaking up the, the information gathering, the diagnosis, and then the decision, into three separate scenarios or three separate types of interactions. So you're capturing the broader, you're separating out some of the detail associated with and allowing for this kind of interaction um, within the confines of that learning objective. So instead of focusing it all as one, uh, at one time, you're actually breaking it up into its component parts, which more closely reflects real life. Whereas when you're doing a training module, you may actually do it all as part of one module. And again, the one other piece to add in here as to why uh, to have in your mind as we go through the next step is really thinking about this idea of experience. And when we're thinking about the types of experience we want people to have, the types of experiences we want to develop, and then organizationally how we deploy it, how we separate, how we space, and what, how do we go about what things do we bring to bear to space those things over the course of time. So what are the tools of the trade? What do we have at our disposal? So as we're, somebody's come to us, and this is where, so if we transition now into this idea of mindlessness. So if your director or your vice president comes to you and says, uh, we have to develop a program addressing this learning objective, why don't you go ahead and develop an e-learning program to address this? What do you do? Should be, right? What unfortunately happens, not of course in this room, <laughs> but what happens often in that kind of situation, it also depends on the nature of the, the, of the manager who's doing the demanding or requesting, what often happens? 
Well, I tell you I want an e-learning module, so I'm going to go develop an e-learning module. What's the budget? What's the time? Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, if, if I'm not giving that information, or if I'm... We actually just have been trained, unfortunately, to just react to then develop the e-learning module without necessarily considering what we ought to really do if we did the needs analysis or if we did the various components. And so how do we then, when we think about the idea of assembling an experience, of creating an experience, what are the things that we can actually draw upon? What are some of the tools of the trade? What do you use? That was not rhetorical. <laughs> okay, what, what kinds of things do you, do you develop or what kinds of things do you try and take advantage when you're tasked with solution development? Job aids. Okay, job aids. E-learning, classroom. Is he the only one who develops training here? He's <laughs> face to face. Anything, anything, anything. We're trying to be, you know, let's expand the, the view here. When you are tasked, when you've been given a task to address a particular learning objective without being told how to do it, what kinds of things are in place or can you take advantage of in your organizations to actually attend to that? Send people to a conference. Sorry? Send people to a Send people to a conference. <laughs> YouTube video. Analysis. YouTube video. Look at their performance. Look at their performance. So when I'm trying to... Okay, so... This was the list that I came up with. Okay, anybody, is anything missing? <coughs> But these are the tools of the trade. And it's not a limiting list, but it's maybe more expansive than we, have, than we had considered. When we talk about this idea of capturing the organizational, the deployment experience, we may not get, as I mentioned this morning, the, from the light, from the perspective of getting the light to go on, we don't know when that's going to happen. So how do we, what tools can we utilize on an ongoing basis to touch the participants? so that we're there when that opportunity is going to happen. And what opportunities can we have instead of developing a three hour module which we know people aren't gonna to get to the end of, how do we break that up? And does it all have to be learned training? No. There are so many opportunities where we can drive people to learn more from their peers, learn more from a manager, learn more from a facilitator, by promoting that kind of engagement by using these in series. But getting back to the to your title, since you're trying to keep your smart manager from making a bad decision, uh -huh. how do we get him to understand when he says, uh, I need a three hour block of instruction uh, on, and, I, and I want to use that new e-learning stuff I heard about. It. And you say, could we talk about this a minute before we go jumping into this kind of thing? And he says, what, try to tell me what I want? Uh, how do we educate them? How do we get them to uh, recognize that there is a list of options? And we're not uh, being a smart ass, we just went to Ken's uh, conference and we're ready to give them a bunch of stuff back. Anybody have an answer? I, I always use kind of a, a medical analogy of, you know, diagnosis. More lipids? Now the, the idea of uh, you know prescription without diagnosis is malpractice, right? You, if if a doctor acted in that way, you know, you, you'd walk out the door and sue him. You know, and yet we somehow accept this idea of coming in and, and saying here's a prescription to solve your problem without having gone through the question. Have you actually analysis. used that with your boss? I, I actually have. And, and, and you still are employed for the same <laughs> well, well, you have to do it in it a way that depends on the culture, though. Yeah. Like you, I thought what I heard earlier is that you work with firefighters and to some extent para and military organizations, which are very hierarchical. And one of the issues we found in Intel trying to get to a different approach for training is when you ask them, did you go through the analysis up front to determine what's the best delivery, they'll say, when they tell me to do something, I can't say, I gotta go do some more analysis to let you know. And so uh, that's one thing, uh, you know, in that culture, but, but uh, maybe different in the medical profession where they're, you know, they're all looking for maybe different solutions. But this isn't, I mean, Ken, just, this is similar to the point I raised earlier about convincing them why SIM, the time, extra time you need to put into SIM is worth it because at a place like a bank where you have a large too big to fail bank if you go on name, 
Uh, you have a situation where you say I want to train X, Y in an enterprise training, and their response is, oh, you need an extra half hour? Go talk to capacity management. So they bump you to another part of the organization where they're actually saying, oh, we can only allow so much time off the job for, say, a teller role. So sometimes, really, it's aligning the right project budget and talent in order to get to the best quality outcome. And not every situation warrants that kind of opportunity. And, and fundamentally, really, the, the issue is, is that we're looking at this again from two perspectives. One is how do we influence the manager to think more smartly about the decisions that they're making. But it's also for us. How do we think more smartly about that request or that demand? So if they give me three hours, does that mean I have to develop a three-hour module? Or might I take that request for three hours and break it up into, well, you told me three hours. But I may space that over a period of time. Or I may incorporate other elements that may, in theory, take up three hours, but not necessarily. I was talking to Kathleen um, and mentioned that you know, one of the things to think about when you have limited resources, um, there was, like, do you want to describe the uh, survey monkey opportunity? Oh, the, the change one? Yeah, we were, um, it was a leadership conference and it, it was similar, you know, the, the EVP of the group um, said we have an hour, we are going through a lot of change, like who's written a good book on change? You know, let's just hire someone to come in and talk about change, you know, because trust in the organization was really low. And where we went with him was, you know, uh, help us understand what problem you're trying to solve. And so it was we owned, like, we don't get, you know, help us, you know, so then they kind of fall all over themselves. And then when they realize they can't describe it, then, then they're smart, you know, they know they have to back up. But we, um, we just wrote a sim in, um, in SurveyMonkey about um, bringing in elements of trust and change or personal change and, you know, trust outside the workplace, trust in the workplace, and, and use the time that way. And just talked about, after we wrapped it all around and see how this is going to help you get a lot closer to that problem resolution. They're paying tens of thousands of dollars to have some spiffy speaker come in and send them leave. You know? <laughs> Thanks. So the, the, the issue there, I mean, I, it is all about design. It's all about the thinking. That's a very, very low cost solution and can be extremely engaging using SurveyMonkey. Uh, but again, if you capture a context, if you capture a story, then you're going to get their attention, especially if it's something compelling to them, and be able to engage them even in a very simple approach. So the opportunities that are out there, there's far more opportunity to take advantage of in terms of being able to affect our <coughs> participants than we, certainly that our managers take into account, but even probably that we take into account. And the issue is not that any one of these is the answer. It's all of them can be the answer. And one of the things that I found you know, very compelling about Will's, the data and the research, is just how many different ways there are to think about setting up those opportunities for feedback and retrieval. And also thinking about the cues. But these are the different ways that we can do that, where we can have somebody go through, play a sim, engage in a learning activity, a scenario. And we make sure we point out to them that there's something they don't know. So they may now be engaged to look at some, a resource, a, an article, some content, to learn a little bit more about that. Or they may be pushed to go talk to the manager, or to an IT resource, or to somebody else in the organization that may have the answers to this problem. And that's part of the process in which, and if we can set that up, if we can engage other parts, other resources in the organization without taking too much time, then we have the opportunity to create an environment in which we are enabling critical thinking. Obviously, we can't ensure it, we can't make it happen, but we can make the environment promoting it. Um, so what is mindlessness? What is When I talk about the idea that we are creatures of habit, a lot of research has been done. It's a very good book by Ellen Langer uh, from Harvard uh, called Mindfulness. Uh, it's a quick read, but it's a very good read. Um, and really orients on this idea of describing some of the issues associated with what makes us mindless. Um, it's not a criticism, it's just a reality. And how do we go about doing things more mindfully? But some of the things, that there's, there's articles out there about decision-making biases and heuristics that, that are existent in our brains. 
um, and things that we need to take into account as we think about what is it that drives us to when the manager comes and says, I want an e-learning module, that we just do an e-learning module. So how do we get past some of that? So we want to be have an automatic behavior. You know, we do. We are habitual creatures. We do want to find ways to engage with our without having to think. So we need to take that into account. And we get tracked by categories. Well, I'm in a learning organization. We do e-learning. So every solution that I do is going to be e-learning. E e well, actually, we're not in the e-learning business. We are in the performance improvement business. And so we're, we shouldn't be tracked. <laughs> Even if we get boxed by other parts of the organization, we have to be able to at least ask those questions, to, to challenge them for the needs analysis, to, to do a job analysis, to ask some questions that maybe open the, the, um, the dialogue, but at least not to get trapped ourselves. Now we get focused on, all we focus on is what comes at the end. I just need to have this be what it needs to be and just don't talk to me about anything else that needs to happen. I get caught up in the idea that I want to, uh, I'm just avoiding the risk. So I'm not necessarily going to do, if I know that my manager says I need a new learning module, then I'm not going to worry about doing the best job I can because at least I can say that I did the three hour learning module. So if that's what I'm going, if I'm mitigating my risk from a job performance perspective by saying that I just to avoid this, obviously we don't want to fall into that trap. If we have been told and we believe, in fact, that this is the best way to teach. Then we may be confronted with an opportunity to build a learning solution. And we may ask around about what are the different ways to, to do this. We may ask 10 people, and one person says what I believe. Nine other people give me other, and even several give a different uh, solution, suggestion. What am I going to go with? I I've got evidence. <laughs> I've got evidence. I'm a right. So we've got to fall into, we tend to ignore things that, you know, we seek the confirming evidence and tend to um, dismiss other. If we're in the e-learning department, <laughs> this is what we do. We, all we do is classroom. The, the department tends to think that way, and we don't, we're not going to uh, upset the boat. We've spent so much on this LMS, I am going to use it until it <laughs> breaks apart. Okay, because we get caught up in we've spent so much money on, or we spent so much time in, or whatever the case may be, we just get lost in that, and we lose the opportunity that drives us to not think as critically as we need to, if at all, in terms of how we're going to progress. So these are some of the, the things, and there are a lot more. Um, which I'll come to some of it. Oh, and a halo effect. Well, John built this great learning solution, and it was just the best thing ever. And because of John's success, we assume that that is the method of, that's the best thing to do. So we give John, whoever, a halo, and we assume that that's, we, we attribute the success just to that, and then we, everything else should be that same thing because that particular piece was so great without taking into account some of the other things that may have um, contributed to the success of the, the context of the success of that. So how do we deal with these things? How can we be more mindful? So we think about this idea of critical thinking where we are, um, and this is something I'd really, really like your feedback on because I, I'd like to, I'm thinking about turning this into a tool. Um, but when some things, so we talk about the needs analysis. So there are lots of methodologies for needs analysis. But if we are tasked with, and we don't have a lot of time, and we need to think through what is, you know, we have that list of tools of the trade. Um, and by the way, this module is already up on the site. Um, so if anybody wants these materials, they are available. Um, so this was uh, something we came up with some years ago, uh, back in the SMG days. And the idea is thinking about the need that you have when you're looking at what modality to use. Because we have so many different choices. How to consider what's the best modality for what it is that we're delivering, is to think about it from the perspective of the audience characteristics and the characteristics of the learning objectives. And this is what I mean. So when you think about the audience, look at these variables. And if you were to think about this as a slide bar, think about where the characteristics, what, where they would, where you would side relative to the audience that you're targeting. Just take a minute and think about this. <laughs> so 
So if I have a highly concentrated population, what are my options? Classroom. Classroom. Okay, that's a clear one that becomes, that depending on where you are on that, will be an option or won't be an option. Um, or depending, obviously there are ways of working that, but fundamentally. So as you think about these things, and as you think about the nature of the audience that you're trying to target, that may provide some opportunities for critical thinking about the need. I may not be so biased towards my first inclination once I've actually taken it through this, and I may have some other options that are available to me. And so if you think of other variables, by the way, I'd love to hear them. So in terms of being able to think through from the standpoint of who it is that I'm targeting, how do I go about, how would I go about reaching them? And so that's one set of variables to look at. Can, can I yeah. I'm, I'm a little confused. You, use, you keep using the term critical thinking. Mm -hmm. And is it, is it critical thinking or decision making that you're talking about here? I know that you've been using the word critical thinking. Um, because aren't you really taking decisions? Isn't this a decision-making process? And you would distinguish critical thinking and decision-making yeah, critical thinking how? is, well, I'm thinking more in terms of a reflective process. Critical thinking typically is more of an analytical reflective process mm -hmm. where decision-making usually has, looks at three or four or five. Well, I'm Maybe assuming that in, in the decision-making process, you are demonstrating critical thinking before you actually make the decision. Analysis. Okay. Critical. So that there is some thinking going on before <clears throat> just acting. So I'm not trying to short circuit that there is a lot of opportunity for analysis, but yeah. unfortunately, many people find themselves in situations where I don't have a lot of time. Where I don't have time for this. And so instead of just, are there relatively straightforward ways at least to allow for the justification? Because I might be inclined to do something, but I, I, need, I need that confirming evidence. Sometimes it's a good thing. And how do I go about justifying this to my manager that this is the way I want to go, even though I think it's the right thing, I'm pretty sure it's the right thing, but this may help to make that case because maybe they're on the fence. Or they've given you the flexibility to go with whatever way you want, but they are going to expect you to justify it. Okay, so these are some things that you can use in terms of the thinking that brings you to that choice, or to make sure that you challenge yourself, or to challenge yourself amongst your peers to actually think this through. I mean, one of the things that's important is that critical thinking by ourselves is very difficult. Because why? Because we're always going to seek confirming evidence. We always know the answer. We're right. You know, to tell ourselves that we're wrong, it's difficult for us to see that. Uh, so the opportunity to bounce ideas off of others and actually go through this, at least in pairs, is going to be something that's just going to increase the efficacy of the or the outcomes of what you're looking to do. The second step then is thinking about the learning objectives and thinking about the characteristics of the content to see whether or not this helps to point out to you ways that would make sense to deploy them or not. Ken, have you tried converting this into a checklist or, or a scoring rubric or any kind of thing that would, you could sort of take <laughs> through the discussion and show a leader, here's the scoring options for these? That's in. That's, yeah, that's the I'm, tool that's I'm thinking about it. That's the tool that I'd like to be able to turn this into. Idea. Yeah, not available yet. You know, it, it seems like there's a fundamental question, and maybe you've already said it and I just missed it, but it's very possible. But it seems like there's a fundamental question on do you really expect any kind of change to happen as a result of this? And we have a lot of people that come to us and say, well, we want people to be aware. And we say, well, okay, but what are they going to do differently? Nothing, but we want them to be aware. And it's real easy if you don't ask that question somewhere early to come up with this fabulous interactive program that has all, you know, greatness. But really, in the end, they weren't supposed to do anything differently anyway. So I just, that's, I mean, that, that, and it seems like we're hitting that more and more, that but people are, well, I just want them to know this is going on. Okay, what are they do differently? Yeah, nothing really, but they want them to know this is going on. Well, so say you're given that as, as an objective, that I want to increase awareness. Okay. So what are your options? Yeah. Email. Well, I think you've got, you have a lot of options. I just think there are a different set of options than some of you might consider. I mean, to me, that's, that's, a, that's a branch. You know, awareness solutions are different than do, do differently solutions. Right. But if, and it's an early branch. It's not yes. And someone says, no, we don't really care if it makes a difference in what they do. 
isn't it fair to say, but why are you want to do this? Oh, we usually do ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Have you thought about it? You have money you want to throw away. Is that what you like to do? Have you thought about it? That would be a great answer for you. <laughs> but what, so, so let me push back on that. I can think of a number of projects that people gave me that they weren't necessarily looking for an outcome, they were doing it to cut their ass. And that in and of itself, why I might not agree with it, if my boss is doing something to the CYA, oh, then we're doing CYA. <laughs> I guess my point is that there can be reasons that don't seem reasonable to the people that actually have to do the work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and, and, and I would suggest that um, if awareness is all that they're striving for, <laughs> That as, you know, depending on the nature of the organization, what we're trying to do, that gives us enormous flexibility because we can hit awareness in so many different ways. And so if we have a conversation with other stakeholders who may not be influencers from the standpoint of the decision that's going to be made, but are, they do own the audiences. So maybe they're the directors or managers or vice presidents of those groups who are going to be touched. What do they, what would they like to see their people do better? And if we can get an answer to that question, then we can certainly build an awareness building program, but that also addresses some of those particular uh, change objectives or skill objectives. And again, are we, are we able to maybe ask or think about it from some of these questions, but also through the, hand, through the eyes of some of the other stakeholders who may have an interest in the outcome, um, even though they may not be part of the decision making process? I, I think when you're dealing with leaders that are making those types of requests, you really have to ask two questions. One, what kind of return on investment are you looking for? And two, what are the specific learning objectives that you want to accomplish? And if they're not willing to answer those two questions, then you need to put you know, a little skin in the game and say, okay, I'm not willing to move forward until you've established the parameters around those two pieces. Yeah, uh, I remember experiences uh, in which we were working on simulation-based training, and we had to bring the instructional designers in. And it was a real comeuppance for me. Here I was, the PhD expert, and the young, you know, 24 year old instructional designer came in, and I said to her, We need to do this or that. And she said, Well, what are the outcome objectives that you want? And I said, Well, I need your help in developing them. And she says, You know, uh, call my boss when you've got him, and he'll send me back to see you. <laughs> yeah, it was a real shock. <laughs> uh, but it basically told me that. The instructional designer couldn't help me. Right? Well, well it, it until point, I cleaned up my act. Doesn't it point and there's out some times when that kind of pushback is needed? Yeah, it doesn't it point out the fact that Addy is a, a model is, is dated. That planning phase, you know, not the analysis, but the planning phase ends up being. Let, let, let's, let's, that's all right. Subject so, for a whole nother. <laughs> <laughs> I said it's <laughs> Patty. Patty. Now, Patty. Tomorrow at lunch, you'll hear some of that coming out of a person who's speaking at lunch. Did you catch that? So tomorrow lunch. Yes, he is. I think. Yes, I know he's here. Okay. Well, similar to that, I mean, sometimes you have to hold that mirror up to people. You know, I was in leadership development for a long time. And the, the person making the request would say, you know, what, what are we trying to do it at? Well, they need to have more presence, they need to be more, and they would use very subjective words. You almost had to help them to see you're judging people based on things that's not objective. You know, just because this person is, you know, loud and speaks up and, you know, interrupts people doesn't mean he's decisive. You know, it means he can be annoying at times. And, you know, you have to, um, and sometimes it's hard to because you're pointing out to those people making the request that they're not you know, uh, being mindful about certain things. And I think it becomes clear as you look at some of these different characteristics that it might lend themselves to obviously dealing with soft skills, which is going to point to a scenario-driven type application, because you can't really teach some of these things um, as much as you really need to allow for experience. But also that but there is going to be a requirement for the blend. So if we deal with something that's, that's um, values-laden, Right? So this is a very subjective issue, and it, it's a topic that is, is, relates to, to, to particular values, either of the company or, and I think that uh, we'll talk about that tomorrow morning, uh, Philip Clements in, in dealing with ethics. Um, so that may be something that, although I want to give you an experience to see how you respond, I want you to make decisions so I can track your responses to see if you are, you know, the values become your scorecard. So the decisions you make will be able to demonstrate whether or not you are paying attention to that. But if you don't know the values, I got to teach that. 
And so the idea that I'm, I'm looking at these characteristics now and I can think about the idea, well, I need both, or I need a variety of, of modalities to potentially, and again, th this is not the be-all and end-all, but it is a way of just, as you are faced with an issue that needs, that requires you to act on it, is there an opportunity to put yourself through an exercise where you can either validate, but to a point at which you can justify um, your first response or your initial reaction, or to actually work it through with somebody else. So this idea, again, of thinking about if I'm being asked to do this three-hour e-learning module, because I need my participants to go through it, that's one experience. I'm really focused in on what the individual participant needs to go through. But if I take a step back and think about, okay, well, how am I going to develop this thing? Who am I going to get to help me develop this thing? Who needs to be part of my project team from a subject matter expert, from a development expert? Who can I enroll to seek this? Because whose experience do I need to capture? Who needs to be providing me with insight into these learning objectives? And then more broadly, taking a further step back, well, what is my, what, what's my horizon here? Am I dealing with the next year? Am I dealing with the next day? Am I dealing with, what, what, what do I have flexibility with in terms of being able to take this learning objective and have it become part of whatever it is? So I can make this, I can have a learning activity. Then I can have, uh, there's, there's weekly meetings that these teams have. Can I give uh, a little um, module to the, the leaders so they incorporate that into their team meetings? And then I can have a lunch and learn that comes up, uh, you know, uh, 30 days, 60 days later, where I just insert that as a topic. Not everybody's going to attend, but there'll be awareness about the topic. And so we will drive for discussion. One of the things that, um, I will actually show this at the, at the end of the placement seems good here. Going back to that compliance um, example I mentioned earlier with the pharmaceutical company. So one of the other limitations that pharmaceutical sales reps have are you can't give out samples up to, other than to doctors. Why? Because you can only get drugs from a prescribing physician. So the scenario is that it's um, you're having dinner at your mother-in-law's. Okay. <coughs> And now, so obviously when you think about it, I'll think it through the lens of things you've heard so far. So we've got emotional engagement is important to retention. How many of you had an initial visceral reaction to having dinner at your mother-in-law's? <laughs> okay? So we're going to our mother-in-law's for dinner. We get there and she looks unhappy. And she says, you know, I, I lost my coverage. Something happened. Lost my coverage. And she's taking, ironically, the medication that you, that you are detailing. And she knows you have samples. And she asks you for samples. What do you do? Uh -huh. No question. <laughs> you know, it's like oftentimes you get the question, well, what will happen to her? Um, I'm glad that nobody actually said that. Um, but what do you do? So, you know, you get two choices. Give her or don't give her. Okay? So, if you give her the samples, then she ends up having an episode anyway, and when she's in the hospital, she has to, they gather information, and they know, they find out that she was not covered. How did she get her medication? She got it from her son-in-law, or uh, daughter-in-law, and um, you get in trouble. Um, on the other hand, if you don't give her, she knows you keep them in your trunk, and she goes and takes them. She still has an episode. And it still gets discovered, and you get slapped on the wrist because you're not supposed to keep your samples in an accessible place. You're supposed to put them away. But it's less slap. Um, but one of the things that was so interesting about this scenario was that if you talk to any rep in this company across the nation and mention to them the mother-in-law scenario, you will get into a significant conversation really quickly. You will bond quickly with this person, and you can take it wherever you want to take it. And so the idea, when you think about this organization, the deployment experience, or the organizational experience, the idea of the story, the idea of, and I'm going to come back to this in this idea of an anchor story, the idea of using something that you can then reuse, repurpose, and engage people in an orientation to the, create the context for learning. Every time they hear something related to their mother-in-law, they, 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 they slide right into a learning mode, and they're ready to receive other things. And so being able to you have this orientation 
when you think about how this is going to be deployed, how can you harness the power of the desire for stories, the desire to communicate with others, so that you can actually accelerate whatever it is that you want to have happen? So now if we shift back to, so this is, that was more of a focus on us as learning designers, how do we go about being more mindful? But then you're targeting back to when we're creating solutions. How do we create solutions that, that apply these same characteristics? How do we get people to be more mindful in their jobs? So the training, if it's not just awareness oriented, but even if it is awareness oriented, they're obviously asking for awareness for, for a reason. I mean, there's a reason why they would say, I would, say, I would guess, you know, I need them to be more aware of. Well, why? Because it's in service of something. Even if they're not specific or particular about why they need to have this happen, um, those are the kinds of things, obviously, we're trying to build solutions to create. So here's some other biases and heuristics to be aware of. Framing. Anybody familiar with framing? <laughs> how you frame a problem will absolutely influence how one reacts to it. There's significant research around uh, whether or not we are more, um, what is our risk profile going to be like if the situation is framed in a loss versus a gain? What would you guess? If I frame a situation one in a way, the same situation, but I frame it first in a way that you're going to lose, potentially, versus a way that I, I, take the, I just turn the frame around and make it positive, that you will gain. What would you think, is, as a person, would be your risk profile, which, and which one would your risk profile be higher? Which would you absorb more risk to have to achieve the outcome? We're, we're much more averse to risk, uh, losing. Your risk profile goes up significantly at loss. We're trying to avert loss, and we will take greater risks to avert loss, whereas if we have a gain, we will actually go for the sure thing. And we may take less to ensure that, and this is, you know, this is not you maybe, but amongst the data, this is, a, framing can be a very, very powerful. Uh, when um, we built some sales training courses back in the 90s, the idea of having, when you're having, and this is a, 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 a training tool, when you're having a conversation with an executive, you need more money. If you frame the issue and a problem, I can design something that's going to help us to not lose money. Is going to be far better, far more potent than saying I want to develop a solution so that we can, you know, ensure that we're going to make X amount of money. So if it's saying the same thing, but it's saying it in averting a loss or versus just ensuring a gain, I may get them to be more accepting to my proposal if I do it in a loss context. Again, it's all about the frame. So when we put people into uh, situations or scenarios, or I put a, a, something that is uh, requires critical thinking, how we frame it is going to be important relative to um, how they respond. Anchoring an insufficient adjustment. So one of the clear examples that was uh, done, I think, in the Phoenix area, a group of real estate agents were taken up to a spot, and the, the mediator says to them, um, this is a plot of land. I think I have absolutely no experience whatsoever in real estate. But I think this plot of land is, is worth about $250,000. And these were all real estate experts. And the real estate is really worth $600,000. What do you think these real estate agents said? Here's a, here's a check. Worth a lot. Idiot. I, they say, I told them I think it's worth $250,000. It's actually worth six hundred. dollars if I hadn't said anything. But since I said 250, what did they do? They're going to give you oh, a reason. No, no, no. Say, eh, it's probably only worth 150. Correct. They may have adjusted. They may, because they're experts, they would know it. They'd realize the value of the property, but they may say 400,000 because I've anchored them. This happens. I think about advertisements. Think about you know what happens in commercials. It happens all the time. We're anchored by whatever we hear, and if it's salient, it'll really anchor. We won't adjust sufficiently. We may know that we've been anchored but will still be affected by it. Even though I've told them that I'm not a real estate expert, I know nothing about real estate, I'm still gonna be anchored by it because they said the number. And so, this price anchors all the time, right. right? And so this is something to, you know, how can we then, if either our people are anchored, can we re-anchor them? Or do we need to anchor them? So they don't go too broadly in terms of how they make decisions, because we do need to harness them and we do need to, whatever the case may be. Again, seeking confirming evidence and groupthink, um, I forget what the F heuristic is. I'll get back to you on that. 
saliency bias is this is that there is particular information that um, we're going to be influenced by because it's more available to us. It is more salient, it's more available um, than I may be more uh, unfortunately biased by what I hear from that perspective. Are you saying from a marketing perspective, is it marketed more often? No, it's what, however the information is available to them. So if there, there's something going on, the information is conveyed in whatever ways in the organization, and you know, stuff has happened, so that may be more salient to them at that time, but I need them to actually not think that way. That's a bias that you're going to have to overcome. And acting from a single perspective. We clearly, you know, if the finance people come in and tell you I need a financial training program, okay, what do they want? Is it what they need? Probably not. Okay, because they'll want something with numbers in it, which may not have any effect on actual decision making. And so, you know, when you're acting, when you, you have to be aware of the fact that if I'm in the finance department, I may have a particular way, I may have a particular perspective on how I act, and maybe it's important that I get an opportunity to appreciate the perspective of others. Now, again, when we're thinking about how we design that kind of solution, the opportunity to think about how you deliver whatever it is, but in a group setting, so I have a finance person sitting next to a marketing person sitting next to an engineer. It doesn't change what I develop, but if I have them going through it together in a way that I get them talking, I may be able to address this without having to actually do anything, other than influence where I deliver it, or with whom. Make sense? Mm -hmm. And to, unfortunately, uh, you hear about this in sports all the time, you know, teams that have lost a lot, um, they forget how to win. And this happens in culture, organization cultures as well. When it, companies been in a bad way, uh, they're in the news, um, you know, there's lots of opportunities for, we get this learned helplessness, we have to find ways to motivate. We have to get, find ways to make them feel better about not just what they do. You know, in some of the uh, yesterday's session with Chad on project leadership, you know, one of the, it, the research shows in terms of, you know, there's a ton of research around why project, how many projects fail. Right, a significant number of projects fail more than succeed. That's like seventy percent of projects fail to meet their, their, their objectives. And when when re, when a poll about some of the reasons why, the number one reason why projects fail is unmotivated team members. More so than any other issue, it's unmotivated team members. So our ability to make people feel good about it, and when people talk about this idea of cost justification in today's environment, I find it just so, you know, to what I said this morning, so interesting that we're in this place where we need people to change, and what happens to our budgets? And the one thing, the one part of the organization that's actually structured to help make those changes, we cut them. And we cut the resources. And when you think about it from the perspective of, let's, let's take a, a bit of scale here. Your budget relative to the size of your companies is what? So small. And the idea that we're cutting for the sake of cutting, it kind of doesn't make any sense. And at the end of the day, when one needs to do a cost justification, if we just do something for our people, we can actually have a huge impact because they just want to be attended to. They just want to get something to help them feel better about themselves. And they'll get more productive, or get better, feel better about this particular issue, feel better about this topic, feel better about this department. That will, in and of itself, improve productivity. And so the opportunity to say, well, okay, if I can give you a bump of 1% in performance, in productivity, would that, I mean, 1% in many large organizations is far more than you need to develop um, a, uh, a, 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 any kind of program. So, you know, the back of the envelope cost justification in this day and age is really fairly straightforward to do because the, the bar is so low in terms of our ability to actually have an effect on performance. Now, one of the things that uh, we'll talk more about tomorrow is this idea of thinking again about, and this goes back to some of the things that Will said, in terms of how do we actually structure the pieces that we're doing. So if I think about the idea of a simulation, and the idea of experience design, this can be applied more broadly. But if we think about this in the context of, of a simulation, oftentimes if we think about it in the confines of e-learning, then it happens, I go through the program and I'm done. But what happens if I expand that view? Again, look, thinking about the tools of the trade, thinking about the different ways that we can address, uh, thinking about doing things in the classroom. 
what are the various, what are the things that I can combine? Well, so the first thing I need to do is engage, right? I need to have a motivated learner. I need to engage them. So I've got the narrative, I've got the power of the story to capture their attention. <coughs> now, I want to make it memorable. I want to make it, make it sticky, right? So I'm going to put in some really good consequences so that when you make a decision, you're going to experience something that's hopefully going to you know, help you to expand that path through the forest, or at least help you walk the path. Uh, I may also have a scorecard in the back, so I need to understand, well, why did that happen? Why didn't my meeting go well? Or why didn't this sales interaction go the way I had planned? I, I had a good plan. Why didn't it go well? So I can break down why from a communication standpoint, from a leadership standpoint, from a trust standpoint, from um, a financial standpoint, wh how, what were the effects of the decision that I made? So I can get a sense of, oh, okay, so I may be making a little bit more room on that path as I understand what drove those consequences. And I may get narrative feedback to further support that. Now, then I'm done. And then next week, I may have an opportunity to get together on the phone with another group of peers that went through the same experience with my manager or the facilitator. And I can talk about that. You know what, I really didn't think that that was realistic. That scenario really just, it missed the boat. Really? Why? Now, if that person can actually explain why they didn't think that was realistic, have we accomplished our objective? Yep. Absolutely. We got them to think. And the beauty of simulation, which I find obviously an advantage over the rigors of instructional design, is that I don't have to get it right. I can write a scenario to do whatever I want, and if it prompts you to react, if I provoke you to a response, I've accomplished my objective. And so I have a lot more flexibility in terms of how I design these things, and then you, obviously you can incorporate it into a large group. But as you think about the expansion of how you attend to learning objectives when you're addressing it from a broader experience perspective, there's a lot more that you can do to both affect them individually and also affect how you go about developing them. Some of the various things that we can go into uh, relative to how do you create a good story. You have a lot, this is, you know, the skill set that's really required in experience design is writing. Either you need to be able to write, or you need to know somebody who can write. Because you can just design and not have to actually script. Um, but these are some of the, the opportunities that you have to drive, again, that first step. And whatever we do, that first step is really all about engagement. It's really all about how do I capture them and want, get them wanting more. So as I mentioned on this compliance, even in compliance, the most dry stuff that everybody hates to go through, you can actually create an environment in which it's fun and they want more. And you create those opportunities where they choose to engage in these space learning opportunities, and they wait for them, um, so that when they do come, they can be utilized. And this is some, uh, some new stuff that I've added to the module of pen, is this idea of the anchor story. If I, once I have a scenario in which, you know, we're talking about with the, uh, the folks at Penn and the Graduate School of Education. So we've, we built a district so we're targeting principals, but we have now built a district. We have students, we have teachers, we have staff, we have unions, we have press. We have, we've just we've designed, as part of the story for this simulation, a variety of players in our story. Is this a one and done? Nope. I now can use these characters. I now can use the district. I can use the school. I can use, I can add new characters as I want. But when I sit, when I pass a new opportunity with a potential student, they immediately slide in. I don't need that ramping time to get them engaged, nor do I need to spend the time ramping. So if I've only got them for 15 minutes, I can only hope to do a 15 minute interaction. If I've got to spend 10 minutes setting up the story, I can't do that much. So simulation may not be an option for that learning objective. However, if I already have a story, if I already have characters, if I already have a bias that I can whack them between the eyes about, I can set this up and launch right into that story, and I can send out an email, whatever the case may be. I can send out a survey monkey about a topic because I, 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 I couch it with the story characters or the story elements so that I engage people in what it is that I want them to be thinking about without having to build up to that because I'm able to reuse it. I'm able to repurpose it. I'm able to engage them based on, you know, again, the mother-in-law. So 
Right? And that's one part of the, and she's a movable character. Um, but it gives me that flexibility to engage again and again in terms of how I structure. And again, not every time does it need to be a sim. So you may do it the first time in a sim, but once you've got this established, I'm not going to use it any way I want. And people have now a shared experience, whether they're in the north, whether they're in the south, the east, the west, the US, Europe, Asia, doesn't matter. Everybody's now had a shared experience that they can all relate to. They all know who John is. They all know who Mary is. And they can relate to them, and we can have conversations about that and not assume that they've got other bias, they've got other issues that are going to come to play um, in that context. So thinking about the anchor story is something that uh, can be used as a tool